Hey Trekkies and welcome to another episode of Trek Freaks, part of the Geek Freaks Podcast Network. On this podcast, if you hadn't realized already, we review and analyze episodes of Star Trek starting all the way back at the original series. My name is John and I'll be joined once again by my amazing co-host Kevin. How you doing, hey, Kevin? dude, we're back. We're back. <laughs> yes, finally. For one week, and then next week it sounds like it'll I, I won't be here. But then after that, we'll be back again. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna kick it into overdrive. We've been apart <laughs> taking turns back and forth with different stuff going on in our lives. So yeah. uh, it's awesome to finally have the two of us back together again. Yeah, it feels good, man. Yeah. So what episode are we reviewing today, Kevin? We're talking about the original series, season two, episode nineteen, a private little war. Nice. I liked this episode. It felt like a very traditional Star Trek episode to me. A little, couple little issues with it, but for the most part, it was pretty good. Yeah, I enjoyed it as well. It was, uh, I when I realized what episode it was, I'm like, oh, it's it's the Vietnam one. It's <laughs> it, it's the one that was supposed <laughs> to be like the allegory to the Vietnam War, and I'm like, I remember this. Let's see if it holds up. And yeah, like you said, a couple little issues here and there, but it mostly <laughs> held up. Yeah. All right, so before we dive into the, the Warp Speed recap, though, I got a question for you. All right, let's go. If you were visiting, if you were going to visit a pre-warp planet, what would you bring with you? God. Oh, <laughs> man, that that is tough. I think the only thing that I would necessarily make sure to bring with me would be uh, like uh, some kind of video recording device to like, it sounds mm -hmm. cheesy, but I, I would want to study. Like it'd be kind of like a, mm -hmm. a look at your own past sort of so i'd, I'd want to be able to like document and study i wouldn't necessarily bring anything that would be different than what the locals are already accustomed to if i was going to interact with them in any way and that's what i'd be afraid of yeah. would be the potential for interaction because every episode of every sci-fi series that has some sort of prime directive or whatever they call it in other shows this always happens where they inevitably involve themselves in their culture and something always happens the orville did a good episode of it as well yeah right they always cause some kind of problems yeah. so, so to me i would like same thing i would bring stuff that fits with them so first you got to do your research right you got to study the planet and the people and society you're going to go interact with and t like first thing i would do is replicate some of their currency you know and their <laughs> food make sure yeah. you have a backpack you got you know in case you get stranded or left to fend for yourself you know, you don't want to have to beam back to your ship, especially if they're going to be out of uh, communication range. Right. So, like, you know, basic food and supplies and the local currency. And if you're going to bring your phaser or communicator or any kind of advanced technology they don't recognize, disguise it. Put it in a, a clamshell or something. Make it look like a rock or a stick or whatever things that they're really familiar with so that they don't see that he's got some crazy advanced technology that, you know, we're not used to. <laughs> Did you just say put it in a stick? Like you put a phaser inside of a stick? I'm trying to visualize yeah, it look what like that. Yeah, like you're just walking around holding a little log, and they're like, okay. "Hey, buddy, what's up with that log?" <laughs> I was, uh, it, was, it was from my friend. <laughs> he you know, died, you know, handing me a log. Got hit by a, a bus, so I saved the log for the rest of my life. I told him I just carry it with me. I, I think <laughs> I, I think the best answer would probably be a cloaking device. <laughs> that uh, should, probably know. should, especially for what I was going for. I should have said a cloaking yeah, device. Blended. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's dive into the warp speed recap. A visit to a familiar pre-warp planet does not go as expected. Somehow these peaceful people who hunt with bows and arrows are being attacked by villagers using flintlock muskets. This major imbalance of power must mean outside influence. Spock is shot by a local and in a coma-like state. Kirk is poisoned by an ape-like beast and is only saved by a local witch doctor. The Klingons are prov are providing the arms to the villagers. If Kirk wanted his, I'm sorry, I got <clears throat> messed it up. If Kirk wants his tribal friends to have a fighting chance, he must provide them with the same. Escaping death at every turn, Kirk decides to arm his friends to establish a balance of power and get off this planet. With the war likely to ensue, the Enterprise continues on to the next adventure. <laughs> so, that. Just that end right there kind of shows you this was a little bit different than we're used to where there's an imbalance of power and eventually it's just like, okay, here's a bunch of weapons. We got to get out of here. We're done dealing with this and, you know, leave them to fend for themselves. Yeah. Uh, not great for the Prime Directive. <laughs> <laughs> it was like uh, everything else Gene Roddenberry does. And Gene Roddenberry wrote this episode. 
Mm-hmm. So he himself wrote this, and it was yeah. definitely his. Uh, he, he he wrote the was it the teleplay? He wrote the, yeah the, the screenplay it, yeah. or whatever for yeah. it. Yeah, I think but, the yeah. story was written by Don Ingalls. Okay. Ingalls, yeah, because that's what he, I put his name in my notes. I usually don't put both of theirs too for some reason because I'm lazy. Gotcha. <laughs> but yeah, Gene Roddenberry did the actual screenplay. Gotcha. Yeah, it was definitely. Uh, I don't want to say this episode specifically was protesting the U.S. involvement in Vietnam, but it was it was definitely speaking on it. And the show yeah. itself was definitely his way of protesting uh, mm-hmm. our involvement in Vietnam and stuff. But it was or in w- with wars in general. But this was definitely his his commentary on it. Yeah. And it's funny that you say that because I don't uh, this is really bad about me, but I don't know much about history in general i don't know the political and social dilemmas that were going on in vietnam unfortunately uh I, that was just not a class i paid attention to so <laughs> just uh, so terrible uh, but so i didn't realize that until you started talking about how this is this scenario and it makes sense like i understand we've seen that in our history before where one side's trying to prop up another and we're just dumping weapons in their lap to try to go fight a fight yeah. that we don't really want to be involved in it's a um, common thing for countries, specifically the United States, to get involved in other countries that we probably may or may not should should be involved in with a, a, an amount of weapons that kind of tips the balance of power. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if we say we're going to stay out of it, then we should. If we say we want to get involved, then we should. But you can't pretend you're not involved, but you're still giving them weapons. Right. That's not the same thing. So, all right, <clears throat> let's get into our mission report. So first we start uh, on the planet. Uh, right, we see they're kind of rummaging around, researching the different resources on the planet. Uh, I think it was uh, Dr. McCoy was impressed with the the plant life and saying that it's like a treasure house full of uh, herbs and spices and stuff like that. Yeah, it looked like he was taking a bunch of like soil samples and like other like mm-hmm. vegetation samples. He had a, little tubes filled with, pow- with different colors of powder. <laughs> yeah, and they see a Mugatu uh, footprint, this, this ape-like creature, right? And so they know, like, hey, we got to watch out for those things. They are kind of dangerous. And oh, what was it? I looked up to about this, about that scene. That footprint wasn't fresh for this. It was actually a stock footage shot taken from a previous episode, uh, which was the one with the the oh shore leaf episode where there was a, the white rabbit. Right. <laughs> that was the same. Yeah, it was the same stock footage shot they used for that. I didn't so even I thought, catch that. Was that. Just kind of, I mean. It's not that hard to take a picture, or, you know, a video shot of a footprint, but whatever. Right. It was kind of odd and funny at the same time. Saved them some time. Uh, yeah. So they're looking around, and we see that uh, they're they're talking about the locals. Uh, Kirk had been there years prior and was happy to be there. He stayed with uh, some of the some of the locals and made friends with uh, Tyree, who's their leader now. Uh, but he's talking about how peaceful they are. These people, you know, don't have wars, don't fight. They hunt with bows and arrows, and that's you know they only use them for hunting. They don't harm each other but then they hear shouting and they go to investigate what it is and they see these guys that you know look like villagers is how they describe them and they have muskets and they're getting ready to shoot other people who are coming up on them so i Uh, by the way during this part i loved the camera shots like they had like sweeping angles and like it you could tell they were putting a lot of effort into this isn't our green screen this is like we're shooting this outdoors, like on location, and yeah. it, it you gotta seemed take like they put a lot of effort a, into it. Yeah, when you have a good landscape like that, you really want to get as much as you can out of it. Because there's so many times when we're like, "Oh my god, that same." You have like three three thin stick trees that are obviously fake, and then a green curtain behind them. <laughs> You're right. Come on, come on guys. <laughs> so yeah, it's nice to be actually filming on on uh, location like that. And they did have to mention uh, how it was a, a very Earth-like planet because they're shooting, you know, outside <laughs> somewhere. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's on Earth. It's like it's very Earth-like. Wink. <laughs> what a coincidence, man! Like, we're so right. lucky to find so many planets that look just like Earth. It did come into play with the yeah. story of the of the episode, though, because it was an Eden-like planet, and yeah, yeah. So uh, we see that that uh, these this more tribal people that use bow and arrows were walking up. They were going to get shot by the villagers. So, and Kirk recognized one of the tribal guys was his friend Tyree. So they, they shout or they throw a rock. I don't remember, but to distract the, um, the villagers. Yeah. Kirk threw and a rock. This turns in, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what it was. And it like made him misfire and spooked him. So this started a, a fight where Spock gets shot. 
Right. And they, so they beam Spock back up to the Enterprise. Dude, when Spock got uh, shot, the way that Nimoy <laughs> fell, that looked uh-huh. awesome. like he put it just full on like ragdolled straight down. I couldn't tell if, yeah. they, if he actually did that or if they used like some kind of puppet or something to make it look <laughs> like if that was Nimoy falling that look or even a stunt double. That was incredible looking. That looked awesome. I think that's just Nimoy's expert acting right there. It very well could be. Yeah, and so they did. I mean, it, I don't know how to say this. It doesn't seem like a musket shot from so far away would be so effective, yet Spock, more powerful than a human, was very much affected by this shot, very, you know, the single shot. And it was mid, mid-torso, mid he's like gut shot. Uh, I think Bones is the one that, that mentions, uh, thank God your heart is in a different spot than ours or something like that, because it was, I mean, maybe it was more of his chest. It was close to where his heart would be. Um, and then we see the green blood and all that stuff. So they beam him back, back up to the Enterprise. Uh, to get him looked at. So this, now that we're watching <laughs> uh, Strange New Worlds, this is the first episode with Dr. Mbenga on yep. it. You recognize that? That was crazy. So I, I did a little research. He's only on one other episode, too, in the original series. Uh, but it's it's awesome that they... I'd never, I'd never seen this episode before. I, there's still a lot of original series episodes I haven't seen. Uh, so it's so exciting. Because then I get to see his character a little bit. And I'm like, oh, my God. Okay, that's who they based him off. Like, this makes so much more sense now. And you could recognize the character traits that they did like carry over to the new version of him it's funny that he's uh that they they had to come up with some reason when making strange new worlds to make it so that he wasn't the lead doctor on enterprise anymore and that mccoy is Mm -hmm. so them saying that he spent a year like studying vulcan physiology or something which is something mccoy should have done years before serving on a ship that had a vulcan you know serving on it but I, I just thought that that was a clever little way for Strange New Worlds to be able to use that to yeah, progress to Bones later on. Yeah. Yeah, so they're <clears throat> they're trying to treat Spock. They introduced that is going to be helping him. McCoy is still on the planet. Oh, no, no, McCoy beamed up with them. Uh, but, yeah, so let me go back to the planet. We see Kirk and Bones. Um, they... they plan to meet with the locals and and try to make sure that Klingons aren't interfering with their natural development and everything. So I'm going to interrupt right there with uh, yeah, yeah. the the Klingons getting involved. And do you think Kirk was in the right to just naturally assume that the Klingons were getting involved just because there was a ship nearby? Like Uhura, Sulu and Scotty were all saying, well, it could be this. They could be here for scientific endeavors. They, there could be a, a plethora of reasons that the Klingons are here why jump straight to the worst case scenario it ended up being true but that is like a recipe for confrontation though right like he's assuming the worst of them right but i probably would too honestly i mean we they they don't have they have a a slight alliance or a tentative alliance with the klingons right a not alliance treaty yeah uh but it is like razor thin and they don't trust him as far as they can throw him so I would probably assume that they're, if I see these people have been influenced by an outside source, then I would assume it was the Klingons just like he did. Yeah, I but just... you got to be careful because, like you're saying, those accusations could start a war. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the just assuming that they're causing problems and assuming that they're there to wreak havoc on a planet, is, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. You're just asking for a fight with them when you yeah. should be trying to do anything at all costs to avoid that fight with them. Especially Klingons, yeah. come on. Yeah, he could have gone slower and just interact with the interact with the I don't know the I can't remember how how they worded him. There were the, the villagers the and knew. the hill people. He knew the hill people. Hill people, people that's it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So interact with the hill people and introduce yourself to the villagers. And if they attack you, you have right to defend yourself, but you know, use your advanced technology and stuff like that to get out of the situation. But when you can peacefully communicate with them you will probably find out from them that there's been outside influence i mean there's got to be a peaceful way to determine that without starting a war right but yeah i don't know that's a pretty sticky situation either way or back out of the planet completely and tell starfleet like hey these people have advanced far too fast we need to send a special team to investigate right Um, and then that's when they could come up to the after an investigation be like oh okay the klingons are getting involved here that's what's up yeah and I mean, the the Enterprise acts as police on yeah. on Starfleet's behalf, so they're there grabbing uh, samples to take as you know proof of 
of uh, you know Klingons tampering with their development or whatever, you, however you would say it, influence. Um, so I don't know. It's it's them doing their investigation, but it might be better if they went in just just their clothes and blended in with their people and didn't make it clear that they were outsiders just bum rushing a building. Because uh, yeah, they're 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 likely to start a war. Uh, so then we see that Kirk is attacked by a Mugato. I probably wrote this wrong in a couple spots, but I'm pretty sure it's Mugato. So uh, they say it wrong a couple of times, which leads to a joke in, of course, of all things, Lower Decks. They uh-huh. call it, it's like a Mugatu, a.k.a. Mugato, a.k.a. A Gumato. And they like list through like <laughs> four different five, four or five different ways in Lower Decks that they pronounce it in this episode. So it's funny. I'm glad Lower Decks called it Gumato because that is the right name that is what is written in the script is gumato right the reason they had to change it was deforest kelly kept getting it wrong yeah so eventually they're just like okay call it a mugato and we'll just leave it like that and (laughs) it was just i think it was at the at the end uh oh in the end credits it's still credited as a gumato with a g uh but it's just funny that it was like okay whatever we're not gonna sit here and fight just change the name we'll call (laughs) it whatever he calls it (laughs) And that's the beauty of Lower Decks to point stuff like that out. <laughs> I, I Lower yeah. Decks is so good. It's so good. <laughs> Someday I'm gonna binge it. I, I'll yes, get caught up yes, on. you are. <laughs> <laughs> Just be it. Maybe when my son's old enough to understand it, it'd be a good time. We'll watch it together. Not the Mugato episode. Um, there was some uh, almost X-rated stuff. stuff going on in the Mugato oh, episode gosh. of Lower Decks. Yeah, almost. maybe we'll start with uh, what's the. other? What's the other new Star oh, Trek? Prodigy. Yep. Prodigy, there you go. That one's a lot more kid-friendly. Yeah. Uh, so we see uh, McCoy goes to get help from the locals because Kirk has been bit by this Mugato, and he's he's dying. He's, like, shaking and pretty good acting on to me on his part. Oh, my God. I put the exact opposite minutes. in my notes. Oh, really? I put Poisoned <laughs> Kirk is not Shatner's best acting. Uh, see, I like it to me. I mean, he's convulsing and he's shaking and he can barely talk and he's going to die any second. It seems like it just look, it seems so like yeah, high school it's a theater. Too dramatic. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's Shatner for you. Yeah. Uh, so we find, we meet Tyree. We, I think we met Tyree before this, but we especially meet his wife, Nona or his Tyree's woman as they call, call her. She's a healer or a, like a witch doctor. Uh, and they study the herbs and plants and stuff like that. So she is able to heal Kirk. But I, I even put it in my notes here. She heals him with a turd root and an orgasm-like yes. ritual is really what it was. Like she holds this thing that literally looks like a, a dried-up cat turd or something. She, she puts it on his cut, cuts her hand, you know, bleeding on it together. And she just does this, like, convulsing, closing her eyes and throwing herself back and forth. And it was... It was, it was weird. Very I, hypersexualized for no apparent reason except the fact that yeah. she was a half naked lady and William Shatner was on set. Like they could have they could have written any other way to sexualize her if they wanted to, but they didn't this was just not to me it wasn't an effective way to do that anyways. But could could you think of a better way to for her to save him without this weird like holding a turd and convulsing on him? Yeah, like any kind of like mystic spell craft stuff like they could have made it like an actual witch thing that was go i I don't know anything would have been better than that so there's a couple (coughs) times where she grabs this this certain herb and she uses it to like hypnotize her her boyfriend or husband tyree uh because you know when he smells it he's like super drugged by it and he'll do pretty much whatever she says but he's kind of slightly incapacitated by this drug too uh so to me, I would have just said like she makes a certain tea, and maybe she has to drip some of her blood into it so that it makes it to where she has a personal connection to it, and you know nobody else can do that. Yeah, that'd be but, better for sure. Yeah, you got a little little bowl, mix some herbs and drip blood. He drinks that, or pour it on his wound. Even better, you don't want to drink people's blood. Um, <laughs> you don't want to put your blood on other people's wounds too. That's that's a no no. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so I think that would have, something like that would have been better. This is just kind of a weird scene. But yeah, like you're saying, I think it was just to over-sexualize her. Uh, so then we go back to the Enterprise. We see uh, Spock is in like a self-induced coma pretty much to, to help himself heal. 
And so Dr. Mbinga and Nurse Chapel are taking care of him. And I think this might be the scene where Dr. Mbega is walking away. He tells Nurse Chapel when he when he wakes up, that might have been later too, but at some point he says, when he wakes up, just do whatever he says. And she's like, whatever he says? And he's like, well, yeah, that's plain enough or something, right? Like, <laughs> Easy enough that's instructions, enough to understand. right? Yeah. Yeah. And so we know what she's thinking because she likes him. So it's like, oh, if he tells me to kiss him, do I kiss him? And, you know, but Dr. Mbega is like, well, yeah, if he says, you know, I need water or you know, call the, call the captain or something like that. Just do whatever it is he says. But right. and Dr. Mbenga knows what to expect is yeah. why he's saying that though. I, I'm shocked that he wouldn't have, I, I don't know. You can tell in the shit. I'm having like four thoughts at the same time. So that's why I can barely get a sentence out of my <laughs> mouth. But um, Chapel and Mbenga obviously know each other pretty well because they served on the enterprise under Pike. We don't know that at this point in TOS, but I think that, uh, Strange New Worlds grabbed that from this episode. So I think it was kind of Mbenga's way of playing or toying with Chapel a little bit by saying, by not telling her the specifics of what he would ask her to do to throw her off to really test to see how willing she is to do whatever Spock says. Yeah. It, I, I, I thought it was pretty good. I love the whole uh, Chapel and Spock thing to begin with. Yeah. But with the the context of strange new worlds it's it's so much better even <laughs> adds yeah adds layers to it for sure yeah so we see umbenga i mean obviously he knows a lot more about vulcans than anybody else on the ship why did it say why he wasn't there before did he just come aboard the enterprise so i don't know if it was trying to say that i i think the episode is trying to say that he spent a year in the past studying vulcans at a vulcan medical thing mm -hmm. but i think the way Strange New Worlds would spin it is that he's going to leave the Enterprise to go do that for a year, which would have been like the first season or so of okay. the original series. So it, it really, I think in this episode, it's just saying that he's done that in the past. Yeah, but that makes sense the way you're saying it, because that means that's why he was gone until now, because we've seen Bones scratching his head like, what is a Vulcan? <laughs> why are you, Why is right. your blood green? Like, yeah. he has no idea what he's doing. <laughs> Um, so that would make sense that Mbenga couldn't have been there because he would have been the first person to respond if Spock was injured at any point. He wasn't. With Spock being so injured and Kirk um, reacting the way that he was, do you really think that Kirk was the best person to lead this away mission, even though he knew Tyree? That's a good point. Yeah, now he's emotionally compromised and he's gonna. He's probably a little bit vengeful and wants to, you know, maybe he, he doesn't get vengeance necessarily, but he's trying to get proof at least that there's uh, influence from the Vulcans or from the, <laughs> from the Klingons. <laughs> well, even without uh, that, just how distraught he was about whether or not he didn't know if uh, Spock was going to die. And then yeah. he's immediately like, we must go back. Like we have to go back. And you can tell that he's like so fired up. It's like at that point, it'd be like uh, McCoy should have been like, um, maybe I'll go with like, Sulu or somebody it's yeah. like I'm going to grab another one of the the bridge crew and we'll we'll figure it out. You don't need to go on it's this. It's funny one, you mentioned It's funny you mentioned Sulu too cuz he's the only of the main crew that wasn't shown at all in this episode. He had yeah. the week off or something. Um but yeah, definitely. Go back when you get back to the ship, there's no there's no clock. You don't have any reason why you have to hurry back to the planet except maybe the villagers will kill Tyree and and your other friends down there, but um, you know, stay from the ship, use your sensors, scan the planet, figure out where's their strongholds and everything. Beam. You don't even have to beam down to the planet, beam all of their supplies up to your ship. So you have evidence, you know, or just your scanner records. You could show Starfleet and say, Hey, the Klingons are messing around with these people. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was just a little, like you're saying, he shouldn't have just charged down there like he did. Yeah. But we did get to hear the, uh, hilarious Mugato sound. Like that <laughs> sound effect was, I, 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 I hope Frank will put it in. So when I listen to this after the fact that I'll in case you can't find again. it, what did it sound like? I don't remember. That's the thing is I, uh. I, I don't quite remember. I want to hear it again so that I could have tried <laughs> to imitate it. But oh, uh. man, I, I remember I, I just put in my notes. It was, it was absolutely terrifying and hilarious at the same time. <laughs> yeah, there's there's sound effects are sometimes really good and a lot of times really questionable, but. Uh, what was that episode where they break a mirror and it was like boing boing boing? Oh, the tr Trelane. Trelane I, one. Yeah, yeah, I don't remember the name of the episode, but yeah. Uh, Squire got this. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah, that was that was hilarious. Uh, okay, so then we see Nona, who is Tyree's 
wife or woman. Uh, she wants weapons. She is just power hungry. She's like, you know, how dare you have the power to save your friend and his people, and yet you'll you would just leave us all to die. So pretty much, she's telling uh, Kirk like, you should give us phasers. You should give us you know, the most powerful weapons you can make, so that we can defeat our enemies, and then we will be safe and we will have peace. Yeah, she saw McCoy using those uh, phasers to heat up the rocks, which I love that they do that because mm-hmm. uh, I think it's Deep Space Nine. I is either TNG, Deep Space Nine, or Voyager, or a mix of the three. They do the same thing. They use mm-hmm. phasers to shoot rocks to create like heaters, essentially. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. I believe I've seen that on Voyager at some point. Uh, so one question I got for you is, everybody always wants weapons. Wherever the Enterprise goes, they interact with somebody who's less developed than they are. They ask them for weapons. We just saw it a couple episodes ago, too. So what could they do different when they meet people to avoid that? Not take their weapons, for one. I, I That right. would be my just, go-to. If it, if it was disguised as a log or... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, why do you carry a rock everywhere you go? Don't ask. It's a pet rock. You don't, it's it, it pet, doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> like, something, something... Disguise it as something simple so people don't know. But, I mean, at some point, you might have to use it. But uh, there's got to be something that can be done so that people don't see them as as a powerful people i think of that episode where i I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head now either but uh they go down to that planet where the klingons are trying to uh like lead the people and take over the planet and yeah kirk is being real like getting in there like hey you know we need to stop this and these people are bad business and eventually it's gonna start a war and the the people are super powerful, but they were just playing like they weren't. They're just like, oh, we're just a peaceful, humble people. We don't want any trouble. We'll do whatever it is you ask of us. And then they have the power to just send them to opposite ends of the galaxy if they wanted to. Mm-hmm. So it's like, well, we could do that. If we land on a planet of you know weak people, we could pretend we were sent here by our creator. We don't have the ability to even travel through space. He will send us where he wants us. And we are here to observe and interact with you but we don't know when we're going to get pulled back. We have no way to communicate with them. We don't have weapons. We're poor. We're relying on you to support us. And then, yeah, you get into hot water, you bust out your communicator, you get beamed back to safety. But, you know, in the meantime, you can interact with them without this this imbalance of power, really, where you have something that they want because they can use it to, to rise up. There was also, uh, was it Nona? Is that her name? Um, her mm-hmm. perspective of why she wanted the weapons and i thought that if it wasn't for this one question that she asks i would have like totally not empathized with her at all but she realizes that they're overpowered by these people that have the flintlock the the villagers have these flintlock rifles now so from her perspective she says we must fight or die is dying better like she flat out asks i think it's mccoy she asks is dying better Mm -hmm. and it yeah i mean why wouldn't you want the upper to not even things out but you always think of yourself as more virtuous than your opposing side so why wouldn't you want the upper hand yeah especially after you see it yeah if you can match their firepower and fight and survive then you know good i guess but are you willing to kill and what do you lose when you decide that you're going to kill the other side is it better to just be humble and die or be peaceful and die or, you know, take up arms to defend yourselves and possibly die, possibly survive and live as a people who are willing to kill now. And- I have a feeling that most Star Trek fans or a lot of people in general would probably lean toward the Tyree side of things where he didn't want to kill people. He doesn't want to hurt people. He's just a happy go lucky person. They, they, were a very self-sufficient society that didn't need weapons until the Klingons apparently introduced them to them. Um, they were able to get along just just great without them, but that one little tease of an imbalance of power just shifts. It shows the worst in people, I suppose, in certain people. Yeah, and I think I think some of that at least comes from when your needs aren't being met in other ways. So, like, if your people are starving, you're going to go out and find either try to find a way to gain food or if you can't you know grow or find harvest food then you're going to find your neighbors and go take their food and you have to kill them to take it you're going to take it yep, to provide gotta for eat your to live gotta to steal to eat otherwise we'd get along <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> i love it that was so, my application for disney mom's gone wrong by the way 
<laughs> so I'm sure when they do Aladdin, they'd be happy to have you on there. <laughs> uh, so if you were to give both sides replicators, but set the replicators so they can't make any type of weapon, but they can make food and, and basic, you know, resources, would that be sufficient? Like if you don't have anything that you need we have shelters and we have food and we have water and entertainment you can grow and develop more culture in your society and not have to reach out and try to take from others around you right i think it's a society though you have to naturally gradually get to that point yourselves i think yeah. if an alien landed here right now and said oh we don't need weapons here's a an endless source of everything you've ever wanted it's like yeah that'd be really freaking cool but what would we yeah. do with it? We'd probably just make bigger weapons. Somebody's <laughs> going to sit on top of that pile, what, on top of that machine and say, no, this is mine. Yeah, <laughs> I exactly. control all the power. I control it, all the energy, whatever this is. It would still create the same level of hierarchy. The same people that are in power would still be in power. And it would just cause more problems than it would fix. Yeah. That actually reminds me of the episode False Prophets on Voyager, where the Ferengi land on that yeah. planet and they have a replicator. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, there's a replicator. They can make unlimited everything for the people, give them tons of gold if that's what they really like. But yeah, no, they just give them the bare minimum and take everything they can. Um, okay, so we see that uh, Tyree says he will not kill. Uh, but then uh, we see that the Klingons are supplying the villagers with weapons and accelerating their advancement. So, I mean, like we talked about, he's going to have to kill at some point. Even Kirk asks him like, what happens if it comes down to, you know, the point where you have to have to kill and he doesn't answer. Uh, we go back to the enterprise and we see Spock is gasping, uh, calling out for nurse chapel to hit him. So now we see what Dr. Mengo was talking about. And she, at first she hesitates, but then he tells her again. So she starts to hit him. Uh, Scotty comes in and restrains her. Like, what are you doing woman? And then Dr. Mengo comes in and, and, start smacking Spock around to help yeah. finish the job. Uh, what it was, was he needed to be slapped to consciousness pretty much. He explains these Vulcans, they go into this coma to, to, you know, protect themselves, to heal, give them time to heal as much as possible. They're using all their mental energy to heal their body, but they go to the brink of death where they almost, you know, die. They have to get so close to the edge that you have to snap them out of it by, you know, pretty much beating them up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I thought that was that was a funny and, I don't know, interesting, exciting scene. I liked it. Yeah. Um, I, what I have, the question that I have for you there is, why was Scotty walking into sickbay? Like, mm. why did he, it, it, it was funny, and it was like, I, I think it added a little bit to the scene. But like, yeah. in the episode, why was he just happening to walk into sickbay right then? Yeah, because he didn't so do at, anything when he was there after the fact. He's like, oh, okay, he needed to be slapped. And then but at, went away. at that point, he's in command. So nobody's on the bridge. He's in command because uh, Kirk is off the ship and Spock is incapacitated. So he's probably doing his rounds checking to see how Spock is doing. He could have just called oh, from the bridge. Man. But, you know, yeah, he's he's got to check to make sure <sighs> you first did and second yep. are doing good. You did yeah. it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um. So, it, it though it it kind of made sense in the story and it was funny. Why is slapping the Vulcan the way to bring them out of this somewhat common, obviously, uh, procedure they do for themselves? This coma they put themselves in. You would think there'd be some kind of like lightweight taser or a synaptic stimulator or something like that that they would put on or use on him to wake him up peacefully, right, or like safely. I'm going to guess that it, it's some there's going to be a name for it. It's some Vulcan ritual that th they have some weird name for and you have to slap them. Or otherwise, you're disrespecting your ancient ancestors. It, that's how they were woken up from near death experiences was by getting slapped. And it's paying respect to your ancestors. You have a, a ritual <laughs> pair of gloves that you slap them with. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. Uh, so we go back to the planet. We see uh, Kirk is teaching Tyree and his people to use the guns now. Like they they stole some guns from the the villagers, and he's trying to teach them to balance out the power. And uh, uh, Bones doesn't like this. He pulls him aside and explains like, how do you think this is any better? They the Klingons were a negative influence, and now we're also being a negative influence. This is kind of dumb. Uh, but do you think that doing this by arming the opposite side, is that the best way to undo the Klingon's influence? 
Oh, that is an impossible question. Because, I mean, that's I think that's the point of the episode is it wants you to think about that question. It's like, yeah. what do you do in that situation? You see this wrong being done. Do you do an equal wrong? To, do two wrongs make a right in this sense? And yeah. when lives are at stake, it's nearly impossible to answer the question. I don't know if there's one answer that's anything better than what anybody else would come up with. Yeah. That's a cop out answer. I don't have an answer for you. So I yeah, I mean I'm thinking like I, I have terrible analogies, but I'm thinking like kids on the playground. If one kid slaps one kid, you know, do you <laughs> do, do you put him aside and say, okay, now he has to slap you to make it fair. Right. Like, that just doesn't, you know, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. It to me, the best thing you could do, you know where the weapons are. You kinda can tell that the people haven't learned how to make them themselves. Take They're, them away. Take them away. Take yeah. take their forge, take everything away, leave them penniless and just with the sticks and arrows that the other guys have and and maybe provide them with some of their basic needs like i was saying food teach them maybe how to grow corn or the essentials they need just to live but don't give them more weapons it's just just you're arming both sides the only thing that can happen is they're going to fight to the death and maybe you know one side's going to win or or a handful of people win from both sides, whatever, that survive. But now their future generation is going to know this is how we resolve our issues. Once we get too hungry or once we expand too much or whatever, we just have to go fight and kill the other side. That's just, yeah, that's a terrible plan to me. Yeah, obviously they're, like you're saying, their level of understanding of the of the weapons weren't to the point where it was necessary for them to have them in order to survive. So taking them away mm-hmm. isn't necessarily taking away anything that they should or like it isn't taking anything away that they need to survive. Yeah, so it doesn't hinder leveling their development the play- too. Right. But what at that point, what's to stop the Klingons from just doing it again when Starfleet oh, yeah, goes? Yeah. As soon as you grab you grab all those weapons and get them off off the planet and then you go confront the Klingons and say, What are you guys doing here? Do we need to go into full out war? Do we need to, you know what do we have to do to stop you guys from doing this? Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> uh so we see Nona drugs Kirk. Uh, with the same uh, the plant and, and kisses him, but we think it's the same plant that she was using on Tyree as well. Uh, so he gets this kind of hazy, lucid state. Uh, and then they're attacked by a Mugatu while he's drugged. And, you know, she's she's got a knife, but she's no match for a Mugatu. Like, it, it's big. Her knife's not going to do much. She needs a phaser. Uh, Kirk's still drugged, tries to fight it. Eventually, he does use his phaser to, to vaporize it. Uh, but then she steals his phaser and runs off to the villagers. And this is after Tyree points his gun at Kirk. That's right. While she was that. using the the tea leaves or whatever they were yeah. so <laughs> on she, him. She's like seducing him with this drug. And yeah, he sees that. He he lines him up. Like he wants to shoot him or her or both or whatever. Yeah. Because uh, she's pretty much cheating on on her husband with this with Kirk. And uh, vice versa. You know, he's put himself in the situation, I guess, but he doesn't, he doesn't shoot. He throws down the gun and runs, runs off, which was the noble thing to do to not kill somebody over, you know, love or, or betrayal, I guess. And bones actually uses that as uh, not that specifically, but that trait in Tyree as mm-hmm. a argument against training these people uh, to Kirk. He's like, you know, Tyree would be the fir- amongst the first to die because he'd be unwilling to fight. So yeah. if you arm both sides and it goes to war, he- your friend would die first, yeah. essentially. That's that's pretty messed up too. <laughs> yeah, but it's also true. Yeah. Uh, so this, next is another kind of uncomfortable scene, but she uh, Nona runs off with the phaser to the villagers, and she's going to try to use this to gain power within her people. Like, I'm going to give this to the leader and I'll be his right hand, and he will wield it to rule the planet. Uh, but the the guys she runs into don't think nothing like that. They're like, oh, we're just going to you know, rape her, take advantage of her. You know, They're trying to kiss on her and stuff like that. Um, and so she, it doesn't work the way she's thinking at all. She doesn't have any control, and she doesn't know how to use it. I would have tried to use it immediately while I'm running away, even shoot a couple trees or something. Yeah, they made her way – after she's had so much power in this episode, like – they made her way too helpless in this scene. Yeah. I would have that liked was... to at least see she pulls her knife and she cuts one of the guys. Maybe she doesn't yeah. get a stab in or something, but a couple good cuts would have made her would have would have balanced for her character better. The way she was in this scene, like what it didn't fit the way her character 
I felt like should have reacted or would have reacted had it been in line with the way that that character was in the rest of the episode. Yeah. And she's a strong woman. She does what she wants to do. Yeah. She, yeah, she, she speaks with so much power in her voice and she's been wanting this weapon for so long. Finally, she has it. If it was me, I would have used it as soon as I could. Like I would have told <laughs> yep. the guys, give me an excuse to make one of you disappear off this planet. And okay. As soon as one steps forward, you're vaporized. You're yep. vaporized. How many men does it take to send a message? Okay. Let's take down number three, number four, <laughs> go back to your boss and tell him how powerful I am. <laughs> like I just, it, I don't know. That was just kind of a it bad, was rough. bad call. Yeah. It was rough. Um, so in this, these guys are attacking her, and they see that Kirk and, and crew come up uh, the side of the mountain. And so they think they've been betrayed. They stab her and drop her on the ground. Uh, and then the other guys come, and there's a big brawl, a big fight, which was, to me, I don't know. Some other fights are pretty cheesy, but I thought this was pretty half-decent for a for a fight scene. What did you think? They had that music, the dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun. Yes. <laughs> I, I love that music. Um, other than that, yeah, it was it was decent, but the music definitely elevated it for sure. Yeah, there's some where you could see like the stunt actors real clearly. Uh, I didn't notice that this time around. Or when right. you see like no contact and like a punch or something like that, but the guy does a backflip. It's like, oh come on, guys! <laughs> <laughs> At least change your camera angle like two inches so you don't realize they didn't make contact. But yeah, yeah this one was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, but so after this, Tyree is distraught. His wife's been killed by these villagers, uh, so now he's ready to fight, and he. Uh, tells Kirk, you know, give me more of these weapons so that I can fight these villagers and, you know, uh, get vengeance pretty much for my wife. And so Kirk agrees. He calls back to Scotty and pretty much says he needs a hundred guns, a hundred flintlock muskets. Uh, and and that's it. You know, you see Kirk and Bones. They're tired. They're sore. They say, okay, let's let's beam up. It's time for us to go home. And they do. And that's all we hear about. So it's kind of a sad truth i think i think that's why they didn't make a happy ending to this is because like you're saying this is mirroring our real history and our real history doesn't have happy endings um, you know rarely has happy endings uh when you're looking at it like honestly and not just what's you know being told to you uh you know history books and news and stuff like that so um yeah so and I'll, also this is the only i think the only episode in the season that doesn't end with that cheerful music in the end of it of you know oh success and we're gonna go on for another day and i think they should do that more often because we have a lot of episodes where somebody dies and yet at the end it's like well that was a rough one let's go on to <laughs> the next planet and yeah. they just kind of laugh yeah. it off it's like dude you lost you know three crewmen on that planet and uh they don't seem to carry that with any weight so yeah i i think that that's kind of the point of the show is to just be like oh that was heavy but now it's light and we out <laughs> <laughs> exactly uh, but yeah, overall, I, I did really like this episode. I think it was well done. I think it was more the directing was was really good. The story writing, it wasn't great, but like you're like you're pointing out, it's trying to follow, mimic, and reflect uh, history and you know Vietnam. So it's not a lot they can do to deviate and make it more fun or more. Yeah, you know. they did have some like personal stakes for some for Kirk especially because he knew Tyree going mm -hmm. into the episode, which yeah. I think is also pertinent to a lot of especially if you think of the united states and the middle east and how we got to know those people uh, well the you get what i'm saying that there are personal <laughs> relationships that evolve in situations like that and they portrayed that pretty well in this episode and then having nona in the episode as kind of just this oddball character that you didn't really know what her intentions were going to be or where she was going to go um up until the end i thought that she was a pretty well written character even outside of that that scene with Weird her ritual. healing yeah, <laughs> yeah healing kirk outside yeah. of that i wish they did a different a different ritual for that and they should have just written they still could have had her die like i understand the story needs her to die for tyree to feel so passionate about vengeance yeah. uh which is still uh, not a star trek <laughs> message right but uh if they just made it a little bit different maybe the guys push her off the cliff but she you know she took a fighting stance and was holding the phaser and then they kick her and she falls off something. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, so what'd you get for the moral of the story out of this? Did you find a moral of the story? I mean, uh, other than the, 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 the war, the history war stuff, I guess at that point it wasn't history. It was like actually going on at the time, but yeah. other than that, which I think was the point of it, there is the moral of the story of 
does the threat of one wrong plus the threat of another wrong equal a right, which it doesn't exactly equate to do two wrongs make a right, but does the threat of a... It, it, I think it's meant to make you think, and it's meant to make discussion like this uh, something around big topics and big situations like this that are bigger than one or two people. It, it's meant to make people discuss this, I think yeah. is what it's for. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with like the moral of, you know, the, the whole issue is them arming one side to overpower or to at least evenly balance the other side you're giving them the tools to kill each other though so you're is it is it okay to prevent one group's death by allowing them helping them to kill the others right it's, death is death which is needs to be avoided on either side so um and also i don't know what the other more like out of this was sometimes war is unavoidable i think is part of what they were trying to say because i don't know i, I don't think they saw a way they could save these people without arming them yeah um so yeah not not our normal star trek messages but i think like you were pointing out before is this is because it's a war that was going on at their time and this is kind of now a reflection on our history so sometimes uh history is sad uh so would you get it for a grade i gave it a c I honestly would think it would be a B just because I really love the B plot in this of Spock with Chapel mm -hmm. and Umbanga. I love that stuff. That's true. That was good. And our first episode with Umbanga who, you know, yeah. we like more now. <laughs> Maybe back then it wasn't a big deal, but like, oh, right. We have some cool context thing. of the character. So yeah. 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 I, I love the, it actually had a solid B plot that kind of even sparked some of the character, uh, the way that Kirk was acting in the A plot. So yeah. what, having some interaction between the A plot, A plot and the B plot is always fun, even if they don't directly tie in together. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I thought it was a pretty well paced story. It was a B. Yeah. I wish they had a different ending to me. It just kind of felt like it fell short at the end there. Like they just kind of like, all right, well, we're going to leave these weapons. You guys figure it out. We're done. It's like, come on. That's not a Star Trek solution, but yeah, it's yeah. unfortunate. Uh, so I think maybe it's either a C or probably a C plus. Okay. A C plus. If they if they changed Nona especially like we yeah. talked about, then that would be more of a B B plus yeah. for me. But small tweaks would have made it uh, a lot different. But another great episode still. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it was darn good. I thought, yeah. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, I hope you guys like the episode. Uh, don't forget to join us next time. We're gonna be watching uh, season two, episode twenty, which is return to tomorrow which i just gotta say right now that sounds like back to the future for me return to tomorrow back to yeah okay i get that yeah that makes sense <laughs> right so can't That's wait for fun. that nice uh make sure you guys hit us up on our website our twitch instagram tiktok discord we always got people chatting in there uh go check out the geekfreakspodcast.com we have links to all of our different uh social medias there and, and if uh, you could please uh review us on apple podcast it helps us out a ton we've don't talk about it enough, but one five-star review helps out more than you'll ever know. So please do that and uh, share it with your Trekkie friends. We like getting out there. So, yeah, until next time, Transporter Room, two to beam up. <laughs>